David and the crew have been in, in quarantine for the last two weeks, and that's so they don't have bring a cold up to the space station. They haven't been able to visit with anybody. Nobody's been able to get close to them who might have a cold, anything contagious. In fact, um, over the last 12 hours, uh, David had his entire body wiped down with rubbing alcohol, and that's just to make sure that there's nothing on your skin, no sort of uh, problem uh, where you're bringing up some fungal spores or anything up to the spaceship. Um, all of those just to make the, the environment on board the space station as perfectly healthy as possible. You're not nervous, you're ready. You know, you're, you, you would be nervous if you didn't know what to do, but you have been getting so, it's like an exam where you know the answer to every question. And all you really want to do is start writing down your answers. And all you're really worried about is that they're not going to let you go today. You know, because you are as supremely ready as a human can be. You, you've gotten rid of, rid of your nerves years previous. You are the readiest and, and most capable you could possibly be. So that's how you feel walking out to the ship. You feel like bigger than yourself. You feel like this is a day that I can handle and bring it on. I want I want I want to do this thing today. You know, what's happening right now um, is they're wearing heart monitors and, and it, it's uh, they're inside a pressure suit, but the, the monitor on their heart goes through this skinny little wire and goes out to a little antenna on the Soyuz and it's being sent to Moscow where there's a doctor sitting watching his heartbeat and, and uh, the other two astronauts' heartbeats as well. And so they're actually laying there nice and calm and, and relaxing. It's still 15 or 16 minutes till launch. Uh, they've been playing them some music to keep them calm. So, so it's actually a time where you really gather yourself. I think it's a nice tradition. Um, things are about to get really busy for mm -hmm. for six months and, and the next 10 minutes of launch are are overwhelmingly busy so uh, so it, it's actually a brief moment of calm before the storm right now and you use it to relax and, and get yourself ready what david has in his hands is um is the emergency checklist there's one page that he's looking at that lists everything that's supposed to happen during launch and the exact down to the second when it's supposed to happen, and then all of the potential waterfall emergencies that could happen if things fail at different times on the way up. And so he's wearing his full pressure suit, he's got his thick, heavy gloves on, he's holding onto that checklist, and what he's doing right now is moving across it with his finger, looking, reminding himself of all the key moments and the actions he has to take on the emergency panel in front of himself, just in case something goes wrong. The, the technology is rugged enough and reliable enough now that they can have the checklist uh, on uh, uh, one of the flat screen kind of pads. I'm not sure which one they're using, but um, it's provided, it's tested, it's what they've been using in the simulator, and it has the, the procedures if everything goes right, but it also, they can flick through and get to the procedures, no matter if, if they had an engine failure or a, a leak or, or all the other things that could go wrong, where they can immediately get to the right set of actions and be reminded of, of uh, what switches and what controls they need to take care of in order to safely pilot the vehicle. So it's just uh, kind of a, the modern checklist, and, and it's nice to see it integrated into this version of the Soyuz. We're getting in cabin views. You're getting a live view. Imagine if you had five seat belts, or, or in fact seven seat belts, where you've got uh, one around your waist, one over each shoulder, one up between your legs, and then one on each knee, just to hold your knees in the right place. That's sort of how you're squished in the chair at the Soyuz, because if something violent happens, you don't want your body flying around. And uh, so you can move your arms, you can move your head, but your body is pretty much pinned. Um, David and Oleg Kononenko, the commander, they actually have a, a, like an extendable stick that they're holding because their bodies are so pinned, they can't reach everything in the cockpit. So they have this little udlanitil, uh, this extender stick, so they can poke all the buttons in the cockpit. And it's really just because your body is firmly part of the ship and it's only your eyes and your head and your arms and your hands that are free to move around and operate everything. You're on your back for hours and hours and the launch, um, you know, the rendezvous and docking could be delayed uh, if they ran into a, a deployment problem or some sort of navigation problem or whatever. So it could be a long time. So uh, on the two flights I did on the space shuttle and on my third flight when I was in David's seat on the Soyuz, um, underneath that big um, official looking astronaut pressure suit, 
Um, David's wearing a diaper. Auto sequence initiated. Auto sequence is initiated. That second tower now retracting 10 seconds from launch. It's a beautifully proven system, but of course it is the most dangerous 10 minutes uh, of his entire six months in space. Engines have started and are now at the preliminary thrust level, throttling up. Engines at maximum thrust, lift off. And lift off. We have lift off of Anne McLean, David St. Jacques, and Oleg Kononenko. All of that propulsive explosive power happens. So what I'm really watching is that critical initial moment where you have more push than weight and the vehicle starts to list itself off the pad. Everything looking good so far. Good first stage performance. Soyuz delivering 930,000 pounds of thrust. And then the quality of the color of the flame, um, making sure that, uh, you know, that the mixture of the fuel and the oxygen is burning properly. It's, it starts uh, fairly rough. Of course, it's picking up a lot of the, the dirt and the cement uh, and the water underneath them. It'll be sort of a, a rich orange originally, and then it'll be coming uh, sort of uh, more and more yellow and then becoming almost almost a clear flame as they get, get higher and higher. The vehicle is, is brute forcing its way up through the atmosphere, uh, just, just uh, taking the weight on its shoulders, pushing harder and harder, pushing through the speed of sound, which builds a big wall of pressure in front of it. And, and then you've got to have enough force to, to jam through that. And it, it causes uh, a lot of vibration, but mostly just a relentless, heavy pressure on your body. Uh, one thing I noticed on the Soyuz when, when I was flying it um, six years ago, you can actually also feel the vehicle steering, almost like like a boat skimming across the water when you turn the wheel a little bit and you can feel the vehicle trying to steer as it goes through the wind shear and the jet stream on the way up. Uh, you, can, you can feel the aliveness of the ship underneath you as, it, as it's directing, uh, directing you through the air. Escape Tower has been um, jettisoned, and those four strap-bomb boosters also jettisoned. They've completed their job and will drop away at an altitude of 28 miles. Um, when you get above the air, when the first stage boosters explode off, it, it gets a little bit uh, smoother, um, and the, the acceleration drops off. It's sort of like you're getting crushed, then you float forward, and then you're getting squished again until it gets heavier and heavier. It's as if you have uh, four of yourself lying on top of you. I imagine, you know, lying down on the floor and having people wearing their full snowmobile suits, four of them lying on top of you for, for eight or nine minutes while you're operating the most complicated machine you've ever flown. It, it's a pretty physically demanding place that the vid was. And we have confirmation of a good second stage separation. The third stage is lit. We'll burn for about four minutes and two seconds, providing 67,000 pounds of thrust. The first stage, the first two minutes, was to get them above the air. And then those rockets did their job. They were out of fuel, and they exploded off. So that was the first big threshold, a really good moment for the crew, the one that failed on the last launch. The second stage, the, the main one, is just uh, getting them above the last vestiges of the atmosphere and getting them out to a really high speed. And then that rocket fell away. You can feel it. You're, you're like being crushed for a long, long time. And then boom, that rocket lets go. It, it's as if someone, as if you were sitting on a bus and someone suddenly pushed you way forward and then pushed you way back in your chair again. And then the third stage kicked in to do all the fine tuning and get them up to, to the perfect speed that'll, that'll hold them in orbit. Uh, the more you know, the more you kind of uh, recognize what can go wrong and, and, um, and how non-guaranteed it is. And so, um, and how helpless I am just watching. I would much rather be on board where at least I could do something. Um, but uh, I'm delighted to see that, uh, just how well it's going. The engines are getting close to shutting down. Everything seems to have worked perfectly so far. They're listening to the Russian engineer back in, um, in Moscow, up just north of the city in Korolev, who's been talking, uh, telling uh, everybody how it's going. Everything's just been right down the middle of the pike, which is great. It uh, looks like the vehicle's really behaved itself today. We still have um, engine shutdown on time and then all the deployments of the solar arrays and things to go. So there's still a big critical step coming, but uh, so far, perfect. Third stage separation. Single liquid-fueled engine has shut down and dropped away at an altitude of 126 statute miles.
Congra congratulations with the uh, Everything's still looking good. The third stage is performing an avoidance maneuver by opening a valve in his liquid oxygen tank. Thank you very much for your support. Antares, this is Moscow. And we have confirmation of the uh, spacecraft separation, Soyuz capsule and crew safely in orbit. Uh, right up until the last second, until the engine shuts off, um, the crew is, is super focused on, on whether they need to go through the abort procedures, whether they need to take over manually on, uh, on making some of the automatic options happen. So it's a huge relief to everybody that when I heard the uh, RPV-1, RPV, RPV d and RPV-2, they're closing the um, atmosphere pressurization valves, sealing off their vehicle so that now they can, with a stopwatch, measure the pressure inside their little ship and make sure there are no leaks anywhere, because that's the most important thing to check now. If the vehicle has a leak, then they need to turn around backwards, fire the engines, and come back to Earth. So they're now going through the pressure checks, but it's nice that they got to that stage. Um, as soon as they've gotten all of their pressurization checks done, and they know for sure that the vehicle doesn't have a leak, they'll they'll pop their um, their helmets open so they get a nice breath of fresh air inside the cockpit. Um, they can maybe take their gloves off, which is a real delight, so your hands aren't sweaty. And one of the things that I really liked was um, seeing my wristwatch float on my wrist. Um, suddenly, because you're strapped into a chair and, and you're inside a cockpit, so there's not a lot of reminder that you're weightless yet. But to look down and see my wristwatch like magic now floating like a little snake around my wrist, it, it was it was like a little secret delight in amongst <laughs> what was happening. And, and I was focusing on the task at hand, but it was also a, a reminder that, that I wasn't in Kazakhstan anymore. Next out is David St. Jacques of the Canadian Space Agency. Congratulations, David St. Jacques. He is now an astronaut. He's been above 100 kilometers. He's orbiting the world. Uh, huge congratulations to a good friend and to Canada's next person in space.